Oyster abundance in North Carolina today may be as low as 1% of what it was in 1900. That number, 1%, is the best estimate for Chesapeake Bay, and it almost certainly applies to North Carolina as well for the very same reasons. So we're in a system in the southeast that's largely sedimentary, in which there's little or no natural hard substrate except what oysters themselves provide in the form of the reefs that they construct and perpetuate over multiple generations. For the past few decades, researchers at the University of North Carolina's Institute of Marine Sciences have been studying the services oysters provide to coastal ecosystems. Oyster reefs provide a number of benefits to the environment. These include water filtration, nursery and foraging habitat for fish and other animals, and a substrate for invertebrates to live on. Oyster reefs may in fact be trapping a lot of carbon because there's a lot of sedimentation within the reef structure because oysters grow up and then things get trapped into them. They poop and they draw material out of the water and deposit it within uh, around themselves. So that has a high potential for storing carbon as it gets buried and the reef builds on itself. Here, Justin takes a core of an oyster reef to study its potential for trapping carbon. Each core is systematically sectioned and analyzed to determine the amount of organic carbon it contains. Bivalves, or these oysters, producing their shells, it's actually releasing CO2 in the process. But this is also leaving out the whole idea that the sediments inside of the reef may be a huge carbon sink. When carbon in marine and terrestrial plants is buried in the sediment, this can represent a removal of carbon dioxide, a major greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Um, I've recently become more interested in oyster reefs and oyster restoration specifically because oyster reefs are the natural stabilizing structure that we've had historically in North Carolina. Uh, oyster reefs grow intertidally in North Carolina, so they are typically fringing along a marsh and they, um, because they're kind of a cement structure, they buffer the wave energy and actually protect the toe of the marsh and prevent it from eroding. Um, and so if we start taking a lot of the shell that the Division of Marine Fisheries collects from restaurants and through the recycling program and start to build oyster reefs along our shorelines again, um, we can actually do two things. We can create a habitat for living oysters for spat to settle um, and also for fish, and we can also stabilize the shoreline um, in a way that was done naturally to begin with. If we look at oyster landings, they peaked about at 1900, and then they dropped uh, precipitously with a little variation here and there from one thing or another. One of the problems and reasons that oyster harvest was unsustainable was that with this heavy gear of dredges and of something called tongs, which are hand, uh, hand pinchers, um, we actually harvested the substrate on which the oysters were attached. So in other words, we destroyed the habitat responsible for perpetuating an oyster stock in the course of taking live oysters. In response to this decline, the Institute of Marine Sciences has been involved in ongoing efforts to restore oyster reefs. Much of their work has attempted to maximize the effectiveness of these restoration efforts. And in the last uh, three years, uh, we've gone back to the Rachel Carson Reserve and we've constructed something on the order of 
50 reefs there and maybe 50 other smaller reefs throughout the North River Estuary and the Newport River Estuary. Uh, and those reefs have attempted to test uh, what governs the success of reefs across a narrow distribution of the intertidal zone. And what we found is that uh, reefs built at, at one depth uh, do very well. And then if you just move 10 centimeters deeper, those reefs fail completely. One graduate student is exploring what mechanisms may be causing these reefs to fail. When we restore reefs in the subtidal and intertidal zones, we're finding that there are higher densities of newly settled oysters in the subtidal zones compared to the intertidal. But if we look at oysters on established reefs, we actually find higher densities of oysters that are adults in the high intertidal zone. Some of the things that might be driving these patterns could be predators, such as some fishes or drills that consume the oysters, or by competition about things that are settling on top of them and competing with the oysters like barnacles and other fouling organisms. To test this, I'm putting out oysters at different elevations in the subtidal and intertidal zone and controlling what things can compete with it um, in hopes to find out if the com competitors are part of the factor that are driving these patterns. The project I'm working on is an experiment in larval ecology in which we're trying to pinpoint source populations for new larvae being produced. And in order to do this, we're using shell chemistry. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at existing oyster reefs, process their shells, and look at the chemistry, look at which concentration, which element might be higher in which area, and then send out a bunch of test larval oysters and wait for them to settle and then harvest their shells and look at the elemental makeup of them as well and compare. And hopefully by comparing we can find what is a major source and which populations may not be contributing so much to the um, living population of oysters. Ian's work will help to identify the best places to protect and restore oyster source populations. There are challenges related to climate change we don't fully understand. Uh, you know, we have a, a unique coast with the Outer Banks, and in some ways the success of oyster reef restoration is tied to the health of the banks. If we lose those banks, uh, our estuaries will change dramatically, and what may be good oyster habitat today will not be good oyster habitat in the future. So there, there are certainly challenges, and uh, I think it's uh, yet to be determined if, if large-scale restoration in this state um, will happen, uh, can happen, or if people are willing to pay uh, uh, to make it happen if we, if we prove that it's, it's even feasible. UNC IMS is on the leading edge of oyster reef research, using and developing novel methods for measuring oyster reef growth and ecosystem services. My favorite way to eat oysters is uh, to steam them and then to dip them in uh, hot sauce with enough uh, horseradish to jazz me up for a while. So I, I prefer roasted oysters, without any doubt. Around Christmas time. <laughs> oysters roasting on an open fire. Oysters roasting on an open fire. <laughs> <laughs>